Welcome to another episode of WTF Cinema. Hi, everybody. I'm still recovering from that Brotherhood of the Wolf review. You guys got no clue how much that took out of me. So I thought I'd go for something a little easier. This is Galaxina. Now I know, picking on these obscure science fiction films that nobody's ever heard of is like shooting fish in a barrel. But have you ever shot fish in a barrel? It's a lot of fun. Okay, opening with a text crawl is almost the law for these bad 80s sci-fi films, right? Because they're all trying to cash in on Star Wars. So I almost didn't mention it at all here, except for how badly written this one is. It really, as you get further to the end, feels like it was written by an overexcited 12-year-old, because it's very... And there's this robot. Oh, and she has feelings. Oh, oh, and she's really awesome. And then our heroes, well, they're space police, and, 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 and so they're police in space. Guys, if this is the beginning of your film, put a little polish on it, man. And now, after four minutes of opening credits and shots of a spaceship just kind of flying through space, we finally get the first spoken dialogue of the film. This is going to set the tone for the whole rest of the film. Infinity Log, Galaxy Date 3008.1. Captain Cornelius Butt, entry number 1736. Oh, oh God, is this going to hurt. We then go... Back to some credits, while the orchestra gets really out of hand. Seriously, in what way does this music convey to you a starship that's already parked? So, as I mentioned before, our main characters are space cops. And the opening of our science fiction epic is them hiding behind an asteroid waiting to catch speeders. Yes. The opening of our movie are cops hiding behind a boulder waiting to catch people speeding. Hi, adventure! So, the kid behind the wheel begs his sergeant to let him turn on the lights and siren and chase after these perpetrators that just sped by. Sarge points out that in the vacuum of space, nobody can hear the siren, so there's no point in turning it on. I gotta say, I'm, I'm glad the movie's at least making some sit. Why do they have a siren installed, then? They're space police. They're supposed to be in space at all times. Why would they have a siren? The alien ship answers their hail, but thanks to their weird vocal cords, you can't actually understand anything they're saying. I am on a police mission. To the flat of the flat of Altar 1. The characters can understand them, but the audience cannot. No, I swear I didn't add that music. This is our captain. He spends the entire first half of the movie telling everybody how stupid they are compared to him, and the second half of the movie wanting pizza. It's not at all irritating, Captain. Welcome back, Cotter. Finally, an epic space shootout between our heroes and the bad guys. Truly the stuff of legends. Look at how exciting this is! Basically, our heroes lose and have to do repairs while the bad guys go off. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Our heroes. The captain then goes to visit a prisoner that they have. The Rock Eater. They look like big, good, strong hands, don't they? No, it's not that guy. I, I wish it was. That would be interesting. Instead, we've got this guy. Meanwhile, our crack squad of engineers are quickly trying to repair the damage. Tubok and Fu Manchu there look like they're really on the case. So, according to the movie posters and the taglines, which is what led me to search out this film in the first place, the main point of this movie is she's a robot with feelings. Now, we emphasize this by having her dress up as a French maid while serving dinner to the crew. We learn that she can't talk, and if anybody touches her, they get electrocuted. See, apparently, space cop 
Prime Command frowns upon fraternization with the female robot, so they make it so you can't touch her. Why are you putting a hot robot chick on a ship full of guys? If rule number one is nobody touch her, why not make it a dude robot? Or a robot looking robot? Why is it gotta be a hot chick if you're not allowed to touch it? Seriously, a crew consisting of just men out in space for seven years and they put literally a Playboy model on the ship as the ship's robot and nobody's allowed to touch her. That really seems like cruel and unusual punishment at that point. Because you're parading around a Playboy model and they're not allowed to ever, ever, ever do anything about it. I'm really feeling that whole robot with feelings thing. The fact that she can't talk adds to it, I think. Now, apparently, that big shootout that we had earlier, forget about that. It doesn't matter. Because our crew has been given a new assignment. They are to travel 21 years away, not light years, actual time years away, to pick up something called the Blue Star. Because they're cops, so they're going to find a treasure. It's what cops do. Luckily, they have cryopods, which is good, because they weren't really excited about taking 21 years out of their way to go get the stupid blue star. So they're all going to take a nap in the cryopods. The proto-blood will not sustain me for much longer. Be certain of your need before you choose to reanimate me. God, I wish. I'd so much rather be watching that. Doesn't that seem like a really big ship for a crew of five guys, an untouchable robot, and a small prisoner? Now, to blow off some steam before their trip, our heroes visit a sci-fi whorehouse. Weren't they opening up one of those in Nevada? While the crew is in stasis, we finally begin the part of the plot that I was led to believe was the central focus of the story. And that's our love story between Sergeant Thor, which is not a joke, that's, that's his name, and Galaxina, the ship's robot. And here's the thing, it's hard to make fun of a comedy, because some of the things I'm picking on are meant to be jokes meant to be. Even the Mystery Science Theater guys will tell you it's very hard to rip apart a comedy for that reason, because the punchlines are sometimes absurd, so that they're funny, or in this case, trying to be funny. But this, sh movie, this movie asks me to take very seriously the idea of this love story. And since the love story is what's supposed to be the central mechanic to the movie, and they want me to take it seriously, I say it's fair game for WTF cinema. During her long, lonely voyage, Galaxina decides to teach herself how to speak and to adjust her internal temperature so that she's warm like a human. The robot can do this. The robot can give herself abilities she's programmed specifically not to have and change her very nature. It doesn't seem dangerous at all. They design these robots with the ability to evolve. They're very clearly meant to be service robots. They're not meant to be fully integrated members of the crew. They're meant to carry out tasks the crew can't. Uh, the fact that they make it so you can't touch her shows that they don't consider her to be equal to a human. She's a thing. And they gave this thing the ability to evolve itself. Really? After waking up the crew, she shows Thor that she's also turned off her ability to electrocute people for touching her. Just overrode the safety protocols that were put in place to prevent people from molesting her. She can do that. Very tight security on these robots. Our brave heroes come under attack from their arch nemesis. What arch nemesis, you ask? I don't know, guy just showed up. But he's after the Blue Star, too. So much so that he was willing to travel 27 years to catch up to them. Now, I know earlier I said they were going to be in suspended animation for 21 years, but Galaxina said it would turn out to be 27. I guess she stopped off for burgers or something. Can we focus more on the fact that our hero ship got shot out of the sky in space? They were in space, got shot, and the ship dropped in space and eventually crash landed on a planet. Don't even try gravitational pull. They were nowhere near that planet when they started dropping out of the sky. They decide to send Galaxina alone to the wretched hive of scum and villainy that is the local planet to find the blue star. 
nobody on the crew as is at all surprised that Galaxina now has the ability to speak. It's not something she tries to hide from them, and nobody cares. So why should I? On the planet, we get a whole lot of Star Wars and Star Trek parodies that aren't really good. Uh, the bartender's name is Mr. Spot. So you can tell we're dealing with some highbrow parody here. I'd also like to point out how fortunate it is that the ship they were on happened to get shot down and crash land on the planet they were heading to in the first place. Man, that was lucky. Unfortunately, our villain has beaten Galaxina to the Blue Star. Luckily, she has a cunning plan to outsmart him and escape with the precious treasure. She spins around slowly in a circle. I'm not kidding. She makes him dizzy by spinning slowly in a circle, and he passes out, and she makes it away. Well, I say she makes it away. I'm leaving out four minutes of film here, none of which is related to what I'm about to say happened in between those four minutes, but apparently... Galaxina got kidnapped by a 50s-style biker gang who tied her to a rocket and started having a 50s-era sock hop outdoors around her. Of course. Now, Thor and his buddy are going to go rescue her. They don't know she's in trouble, but they're going to go check on her anyway. The reason only the two of them are going is because the rest of the crew is suffering from pretty severe whiplash due to the crash landing. These are the jokes, people. One daring escape later, they finally get back to their ship, only to discover that the villain has taken control of it. The villain who shot this ship down, forced it to crash land, has decided to use it as his escape vessel to get the Blue Star back to wherever it is he wants it to go. Now I'm going to take his ship, the superior ship that shot down the ship he's in now. He'd rather take this banged up crate that he almost destroyed. Good plan. Okay, seriously? The villain is watching the first starship on Venus. This movie apparently feels so bad that I'm having to watch it. It's showing me clips from movies that featured on Mystery Science Theater. Really? First spaceship on Venus. Oh, that's nice. Hey, where are you coming? While our heroes are in captivity, we get a lovely little exchange between Thor and Galaxina. Because remember, this movie was sold as a love story between these two characters, even though very little has happened. He expresses concern that she doesn't have a, you know, uh, by which I'm fairly sure he means vagina. But she assures him that she can order one out of a catalog. You can just feel the romance... Also, if this is a model used by the space cops and they don't want people fraternizing, why are vagina attachments available? Later, he's also very upset that they can never have children. Luckily, they can order those from the catalog as well. What a wonderful catalog. Anyway, let's wrap it up. Uh, our heroes escape. They beat up the bad guy. They deliver the goods. They're heroes. Except none of that happens. Instead, the day is saved by the punchline to a really bad joke from the very beginning of the film that I left out because I didn't care. I'd say the ending is anticlimactic, but that implies that it, action actually rose to a point where a climax was expected, and that wasn't the case. This movie is just a hodgepodge of things thrown against the wall to see what sticks. The narrative is spotty at best. I made it sound cohesive. But you don't find out what the characters are actually after until, like, halfway through the movie. You never find out who the bad guy is or why. And There's not a lot of information to go on. It's really just an excuse to have a string of science fiction parody scenes that are loosely tied together by what the writer has decided to call a plot. And then after they made the movie, they apparently decided to sell it as a movie about a female robot with feelings. That's even on the movie poster. It's, in the future, we've created robots who can feel. Her feelings and her relationship with Thor is maybe 15 minutes of this movie. The rest is really bad jokes that don't work. 
So, nice try on that packaging deal, trying to tell us that this is the point of the movie. It's not. There is no point to this movie. It's just boring. It's not funny. It's not compelling. It's just dull. Still, it's an hour shorter than Brotherhood of the Wolf. Thank you, Galaxina. Thank you for watching WTF Cinema. Until next time, what the f man?